All right, so the first topic we're going to have tonight is Mary. And Mary's a big one. I was speaking to someone, had coffee with a young man uh, just this morning, and uh, I asked him, I said, what are, you, what are you most concerned with when you think about Catholicism? What is it that's on the top of your mind? He said, what's well, Mary? And I think if we polled the people in this area for what is it that, that is, is, uh, you, do you find strange about Catholicism, concerning about Catholicism, I think uh, the top answer would come back uh, for Mary. Uh, why, why do Catholics, in their words, this is going to be the challenge that we start with, why do you worship Mary? Why do you worship Mary? And, uh, and so I'll, I'll give this as a, as a headline, apostasy alert. Pope Francis declares worship of Mary is a requirement. And this is a website that concerns itself with letting everybody know that the Antichrist is here and that the end of the world is coming. And uh, again, this, this is nonsense. We don't. That's a good, a good answer. By the way, that should be a good answer or a, an easy answer when someone says, why do you worship Mary? We don't. <laughs> we don't worship Mary. Of course we don't worship Mary. Only God can be worshipped. And if we did worship Mary, guess what that would make us? An idolater. We'd be guilty of idolatry, right? Uh, which is a very, very, very serious sin. So, so we don't worship Mary. We only worship uh, God alone. That's the first and foremost thing that we can, we can share with others. And then we can press the point. We don't worship her, but we do honor her. And we honor her a great deal. And so when someone asks, why do you worship Mary? I think that they could, if you change that question and say, I think what you're really asking is, why do we honor her as much as we do? Or why do we honor her more than Protestants do? Or more than, uh, say, Baptists are used to do it? So I'll pull up. These are the questions that we were talking about. Questions concerning the church. Questions concerning the sacraments. Why do you worship uh, Mary, if they'd ask that? I believe you, uh, Catholics honor Mary too much, they would say. Maybe even equal to Jesus, or at least in their mind. Alright, so let's begin here. The honor given to Mary. This is from Paul VI and from the Catechism. We believe that the Holy Mother of God, that's one title that we give Mary, and many Protestants don't. We call her the Mother of God. The mother, or the second title, the New Eve. That sounds strange to a Protestant's ears, to a Baptist ear. Uh, that in the same way that Jesus is the New Adam, we see Mary as the New Eve. And they may have never heard of that. By the way, I, I'm gonna, uh, these three titles are very, very good to start explaining uh, why we honor Mary. The new Eve is thoroughly biblical. And uh, we'll show you that in just a minute. The mother of the church. Where in the world do you get this idea? And again, from, from the perspective of Baptists and Protestants, this really seems out of left field. They'll say, none of this is in the Bible. Right? Mary's not the mother of God in the Bible. Mary's not the new Eve in the Bible. Mary's not the mother of the church in the Bible. And what they're saying with that, it's not that they've never read the Bible. It's that when, you remember the song, Rose Colored Glasses? Right? <laughs> when we see certain things, we are influenced by our surroundings and what our pastor highlights or what their background may be. And so when they read through the Bible, they don't, these things don't leap off the page at them. But it's one of those things that when you show them through Scripture... Uh, especially with these three titles, I think it is very meaningful. It was meaningful to me. So let's start with this title, The Holy Mother of God. Mary as the Mother of God. And this is, of course, when she visits Elizabeth, and she, Elizabeth, spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou, Mary, among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. The mother of my Lord. Right? So, saying that Mary is the mother of the Lord, saying that Mary is the mother of God, does not mean that Mary was alive or that she existed before God did, right? Which is what many people will say. They'll say, listen, you could call Mary the mother of Jesus, you could call her the uh, mother of Christ, but you can't call her the mother of God. She's not the mother of God, she's just the mother of Jesus. And if you really sift through this, by the way, this is an old question, you really sift through this. What they're saying is Mary is the mother of the human part of Jesus, but she's not the mother of the divine part of Jesus. And so it's a separation of the two natures. And I were to ask you, was Jesus Christ one person? You'd say yes. And I'd say, did he have two natures united in one person? The answer to that is yes. Right? 
And then if I asked you, did he have two wills united in that person? You would also say yes, right? We could get into the Trinity a little bit with this, but this is actually a Trinitarian question. Uh, many Protestants don't realize that. If you say she's the, mayor, if she's the mother of Jesus, uh, his human nature, but not his divine nature, you're, you have Trinitarian problems. You're separating the two natures of Christ. He was one person, but with two natures. And I'll draw that out uh, here underneath. This is a little history lesson. You don't have to memorize this, but it, it would be helpful to know at least that it's come up before. In the 5th century, 431, Third Ecumenical Council, church came together at Ephesus to reaffirm the Nicene Creed and to condemn a guy named Nestorius. Now, Nestorius was an important guy in the church, patriarch of Constantinople. And guess what he taught? He said, Mary can be considered the mother of Christ, but not the mother of God. Why did he deny it? He says, Nestorius denied that it was possible for the human nature and the divine nature to be united in one person, a hypostatic union. Now, that is Trinitarian belief. And you can ask people, don't you believe in the Trinity? That, they may think that's a weird question. Why do you think Mary's the mother of God? Well, don't you believe in the Trinity? Many people don't realize that's what they're dealing with when we deal with it. All right, it says the biblical support we have for this union of the divine and human nature in Christ is support for Mary as truly the mother of God. That is, if Jesus is one person with two natures, then Mary is the mother of God. She didn't give birth to a, one nature. She gave birth to a person. The person with Jesus Christ. Was He 100% man? Yes. Was He 100% God? Yes. So was Mary the mother of God? Yes. Right? And that's what we're asking or what we're talking about. Now, if you just want an example of Scripture, it's used in Scripture. Elizabeth looks at her and says, you're the mother of my Lord. And Mary doesn't stop and say, no, don't call me that. Right? <laughs> just the human side of Jesus. Right? So it's both biblical and uh, theological as well. The Holy Mother of God. Alright, the New Eve. This is one of my favorite ones to talk about. I did include this tonight, but uh, another one that's along these lines is calling Mary the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the New Covenant, which is a pretty neat idea as well. But we won't go into that uh, tonight for the sake of time. All right, so Genesis 3. Let's read just portions of this. Adam called his wife, wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And if you go through Genesis, what's the title that's given to Eve very often, is the woman. The woman. The woman. We'll see that in the New Testament. So often when Jesus refers to his mother, he calls her woman. Now, hearkening back to this idea in Genesis. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also to her husband with her, he did eat. The Lord God said unto the servant, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Right? This is the first gospel that we have in the Bible. So the first Eve, the mother of all living, and what happened? Well, she was tempted and she disobeyed God, and she encouraged other people, right, Adam, to disobey God. And God said that in the future, that the devil, represented by the serpent here, would have this war between uh, the serpent and between her seed, right? Her offspring, which is Christ, and we'll see includes others as well. Mike, did you have a question? No. Oh, okay. uh, Alright, so down here in Romans chapter number five. And for, for some that have are familiar with this and thinking about Old Testament figures of Christ, the title, the new Adam, that, that Christ was a new Adam. Uh, this may be familiar with, with anybody that asks this question. So in Romans chapter 5, it says, As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, this is Adam, so death passed upon all men for all of sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So Adam was a figure of who? The one that was to come? That's Jesus, the new Adam. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. One man disobeyed and plunged us into sin. The new Adam obeyed and brings us redemption, right, as a human nature. Now, 
Where does Paul link? So we have him linking Adam and Christ. Where does he link Eve with Mary? Ha! They got us. We call her the new Eve, and it's not there in Romans. And they're right, because it's in Revelation. Right? <laughs> it was John instead of Paul, but still in Scripture. Just as an explanation, Jesus Christ is in figure of the new Adam, whereas Adam disobeyed, Christ <coughs> obeyed, merited salvation to the sons of Adam. All right, last sentence there in that paragraph says, The early church saw Mary in Scripture as the new Eve, the spiritual mother of all who are in the new Adam, Jesus Christ. And so we'll begin Luke chapter number 1. Does this sound familiar? Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are you among women. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good thing to bring out as well. Somebody said, well, you said, we, maybe we can touch on repetitious prayer a little bit. Why do you pray that Hail Mary? You just pray it over and over and over again. Well, we're just praying the Bible. Right? That's all we're doing. And it's, it's great to point that out. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the Bible says, Blessed is she that believed there should be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary, says a Savior is coming into the world, and this is the moment where women get a second chance. Right? <clears throat> uh, in the first chance, right, women don't come out very well. They look kind of bad, right? The, the serpent uh, seeks to, to, to deceive Eve. She is deceived. She plunges into to misery, right? Adam was there along the way as well. But uh, that we struck out the first time. Here we have the redemption of that and the second chance. So here we had the perfect woman make user free will for evil. And here we have another chance. And so Mary's life prepared for this moment. She has the moment where she can believe. And if she obeys the Lord, then all that is undone in Eve uh, becomes uh, fixed in Christ. And she believes. And because she believes, Christ comes into the world. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, moment of salvation history. And then now we go to John. Uh, why does John, by the way, I said Paul didn't reference these things, but John did. Why do you think John would be one that would concentrate on Mary? Luke concentrated on her as well, but, but why, why John? Well, we're, we'll see in just a moment that, remember when Christ is on the cross, he gives John a special mission. Right? To take care of his mother. We're going to see. We're going to draw that out for us as well. So in John chapter 2, Jesus says unto her, remember this is Mary saying, he's run out of wine. And Jesus looks at her and says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? And I was a Baptist pastor who said, Look, that's disrespectful even. All. What, what, woman? What, what do you want me to do? Right? And that's not, not in any way the way that Jesus was saying that, but it confused me. I said, Why was he using the word woman? rather than, than saying mom or, 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 or Mary. But remember what Genesis, when Genesis refers to Eve, what's, what's the, the word that God use, uses for Eve? It's woman, right? Woman. And so Jesus is using that language. Jesus says to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, whatever he says unto you, do it. So Eve looks at Adam and says, you better eat this too. And Adam says, okay, I guess I'll disobey as well. The new Eve looks at us, not only does she obey God, but she looks at us and says, whatever he says, do it. And so again, that, that new Eve role. Now, later in John, of course, when Christ is on the cross, it says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved. By the way, he could have said John, but he says the beloved disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. Why wouldn't you use the name John? I think it's a special part in Scripture where God wants us to see ourselves standing beside the cross as a beloved disciple. Because what He's going to do is not just for John, it's for us. He says to that beloved disciple, or excuse me, He says to His mother, Behold thy son. Woman, there's that word again, Behold thy son. He says to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And so Mary becomes John's mother, and John becomes Mary's son, but he doesn't use that name John. He just says the beloved disciple because at this moment, Jesus is encouraging not just John, but us to see Mary as our mother. This is the Lord Jesus before he dies, giving his mother uh, to all beloved disciples. Using that general word woman for Mary and the beloved disciple for the disciple. 
So John, this is the Gospel of John. Later, John writes the Revelation. He draws these images again. Revelation chapter number 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman, there's that word again, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. By the way, so often, even just a, an image of Mary in this way, with crown, a, a crown of stars upon her head, standing upon the moon, arrayed as Revelation describes her, that's offensive to Protestants and Baptists. They haven't seen her in this way. They don't think of Mary in this way. But again, it's biblical. On her head a crown of twelve stars. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, who is that? That's obviously Jesus. This is obviously Mary. Her child was called up to God and to the, His throne. And where's the serpent? The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. The dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, having put that close to Genesis, I, I hope that some things stand out to you. Because John has given us that story again. And John does this in a couple other places, his references to the Garden of Eden. But here he has the serpent, here given as the great dragon, who is the devil. He has the new Adam, which is this one who was born, who is going to rule the nations with the rod of iron. He mentions the seed. Remember back in Genesis where God looks at the serpent and says, your seed and her seed are going to have enmity. References her seed. And here he has the woman again. The woman is Mary. And the woman is the new Eve. When we call her the mother of God, we have reasons. When we call her the new Eve, we point to Revelation. And uh, by the way, this is a Bible study. This you have to kind of take a while. But... For Protestants or Baptists that, that take the time to look at it, this is really profound. When I saw this, it was, it was very striking to me that she was the new Eve. Another point with this last point is that it says that the dragon tries to destroy Jesus. He doesn't. But then he goes out to make war with the woman's seed, the woman's offspring. Well, who is that? Remember, we called that third title. Not only was she the mother of God, not only is she the new Eve, we call her the mother of the church, the mother of all believers. So we point to when Jesus says, Behold your mother on the cross. That's number one. But also we'd say, Listen, the devil's out making war with all of Mary's offspring. Well, who is that? And it says, It's those who keep the commandments of God. That's us. That's believers. And so Mary's our mother. It's John's mother, our mother, Jesus' mother. Of course we're going to reverence it. When we get to that point, you say, listen, why do we honor Mary? The Bible says, one of the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother. And so if Mary is our mother, if Jesus loved his mother, we should love our mother. If Jesus honored his mother, surely we should honor our mother. There's a few steps between here and there for Protestants and Baptists, right? They don't consider Mary the mother of all believers. They've never seen she's the new Eve. She doesn't see, they don't see the central role that the Bible places with these things. And so for them, it, it, it's very strange. This is very sad, by the way, because the, uh, uh, Martin Luther, for instance, held Mary in high esteem. It was only after time that Mary was denigrated, Mary was disrespected because it was thought to be too Catholic. Not because Mary deserved it, but just because it was an anti-Catholic movement. And so the idea that uh, Mary, and I, I can speak from experience, where you have women's groups and you have people that would speak on the great women of the Bible, you could speak on really any woman of the Bible, when it came to Mary, you had to be very careful. Because if you honored her too much, you sounded kind of Catholic. Right? And so this is scary language and a scary subject for a lot of, a lot of people, but it's one that's thoroughly uh, biblical. And of course, by the way, uh, a great comfort uh, once, uh, once someone comes to see these types of things in Scripture, I remember for, uh, for um, my study of Catholicism, which I did a long time ago, uh, I even got to the point where I would pray the um, uh, Divine Mercy Chaplet. But I wouldn't pray a Hail Mary. Because I was so scared that if I did that, you know, I was an idolater. Right? And somehow if I did that, I was capped. I crossed the line and God wouldn't be happy with me. Even though it's a biblical prayer, even though the Bible gives her as, as my mother, even though the Bible uh, gives her, in good theology, gives her all these titles, for me it was scary because it was Catholic. 
And so we, we, we hopefully can understand that enough that we can present it to those who object. So if you look on your verse finders, this is going to be on the back. The back's the one with the uh, barcode. And look in column one. And you'll have Mary. You'll have her as the mother of God. You have the Assumption. You have the Immaculate Conception. Perpetual Virginity. But I would recommend if people start to ask about Mary to start with this idea. Say, do you think she's the mother of God? Let's start there. Do you know that she's the new Eve? Can I show you from some passages in the Scripture? Do you know that she's the mother of the whole church, of all believers? And I show you that in Revelation. And uh, once you come to see those things, you may be a little bit more comfortable when you start to talk about uh, the Assumption, the Immaculate Conception, and her perpetual virginity. Also, another point, Luther believed in the perpetual virginity of Mary as well. This is something that changed later on in, in Protestant Paul. All right. Any questions on that? Any thoughts along the way? I like, <clears throat> I like the idea that the, the last thing that Mary said in the Bible, her last words were, do whatever he tells you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I think that uh, sometimes they'll, they'll, I've heard an objection where they'll say, they'll reference a story when someone said, blessed uh, is the woman who mothered you when you were a child, speaking to Jesus. And he said, you know, uh, or, or the time when uh, they said, look, there are people, your family's outside, your mom's outside, your family's outside, and they're trying to talk to you. And he says, who's my mother? Who's my brothers and sisters? But they who do the will of God. Say, so see, Jesus puts, puts her right there. It says that what's important is obedience. But the point there is, who was the most obedient person to the commandments of God? And it was Mary. So if all those are his mother and his brothers and sisters, then how much more of a special place does she have? All right, let's move on. Why don't you want people to read the Bible? Catholics don't read the Bible. Catholics don't know the Bible. Catholic Church banned the Bible. I don't know if you've ever heard uh, any of these things. Chain the Bible. Chain the Bible. Chain the Bible. We thought about doing that just as a joke in the gift shop, right? Put a chain on at least one of the Bibles, but no, we haven't done it. Right? The, <clears throat> it's funny to accuse Catholics of not liking the Bible because it's our book. Right? It's very important for us to understand that. If we, if we think about, well, who wrote it? Of course, we're going to claim Catholics wrote it. Well, who canonized it? That is, chose which books to put together. Because that was done over the first few hundred years of the church. Who did that? The Catholic Church did. Who preserved it, right? It didn't run Xerox copies. It wasn't on, uh, loaded onto the internet. Who kept up with these things for, for th uh, thousands of years? Well, it was the Catholic Church. We wrote it. We preserved it. We canonized it. Uh, translated it. Uh, studied it. Preached it, right? We, we've been along with it uh, and interpreted it. It's our book. And so to say that we don't want people to read it is silly. In fact, it's one of, I spoke about this with our call form sent classes, it's one of the indulgences, one of the most powerful indulgences that the church offers. Every day, you could get four plenary indulgences. You now the church offers, by the way, don't, you don't have to get into the weeds with people. With, when we start talking about indulgences, there's a lot that we won't be able to get into that. But... Um, just talking about the way the church uh, encourages Catholics to read the Bible, one of the four that, that uh, are plenary indulgences, which is fairly easy to do on a daily basis, is to read the Bible for 30 minutes. If you read the Bible for 30 minutes in a way that's worthy of, of reading Scripture, and you go to confession several days before or after doing that, and you see, receive communion, and you pray for the intentions of the Pope, and you're disconnected from all love of sin. <laughs> That's the hardest one. <laughs> to the extent that you're disconnected from all attachment to sin, the church offers you a plenary indulgence, which means you get that's your get out of uh, free from purgatory card, right? And uh, but it's the idea. By the way, well, how for those of us that aren't completely un uh, attached from sin, right? We we need some purgatory. We're talking about purgatory in just a minute, but that's how much the church wants us reading scripture. I mean, that to, to encourage us in, in that kind of way. The church, uh, of course, when we think about the uh, scriptures as infallible and perfect and word for word preserved, all of those things are Catholic ideas. And I'll skip down 
I have several quotations from. Just open the Catechism. All of these paragraphs are about Scripture. But uh, paragraph 133. The church forcefully and specifically exhorts all of the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent reading of the divine scriptures. Look at this last. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. You don't know your Bible very well? The church says you probably don't know Christ very well. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. That's about as strong of a statement as you can, as you can give. And there's lots of resources as far as historically that the Catholic Church has translated the Scriptures continuously as a mission um, and uh, preserved these things and, and, and been at the forefront of uh, presenting Scriptures. So this one's just false. Many times when people are asking this, they're saying, you stress tradition, not just the Bible. And I think that's a, a better uh, way to approach this. When you say, uh, you know, we love the Bible too, you love the Bible I like to point out, if you've got, and most people will, will admit to this, if you've got ten different people from ten different denominations to sit around the table, and they all had one Bible, or they all had the same Bible, and they pointed to a specific passage, do you know you could get ten different interpretations of that one passage? Now, wait a second, isn't the passage perfect? Yes. God guarantees the passage. You know what He doesn't guarantee? That we all get the interpretation correct. And so if they say, well, we all have a, 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 you know, our opinion, and who's to know what the difference? Well, uh, that's where we can point out that Jesus gave us a tradition. He taught the apostles in a certain way. The apostles taught the next generation in a certain way. And that's Catholic tradition. When you think about tradition, and when you mention tradition, it's the apostolic tradition that we're passing along. And so historically, we can look back, and this is pretty neat. I didn't even know this as a Baptist Protestant. You can point this out. You say, do you believe that the apostles interpreted the Bible correctly? And I will agree with that. Of course they did. Well, do you think that the apostles thought it was very important to train the next generation to interpret the Bible correctly? Well, of course that's right. right? Did you know that we still have the writings of the men the apostles personally trained? Now, not just the Bible. We have those that they trained. And they give us a glimpse of that apostolic tradition. And then they went and trained more men, and they went and trained more men. That's what Paul commanded in, in Timothy. So who are these three men? And I like to point out these three. Uh, you can write these down or, or just uh, see me after as well. Ignatius of Antioch, his feast day is coming up, I think the 17th of this month. Uh, Clement of Rome and Polycarp of Smyrna. Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, and Clement of Rome. I just want to... As good of whoever you're talking to, they say Pastor Bob has 14 degrees and he knows the Bible backwards and forwards and all that. I bet his resume is not as good as these three men. One of my favorites is Ignatius of Antioch. When I said has his feast day coming up, Ignatius of how's how's this for a resume? Ignatius pastored in Antioch. What's special about Antioch? Well, if you read the Bible, the Bible says that Antioch was the place where they first were called Christians. That's pretty, that's pretty good, right? And they called them Christians. Why? Because they acted like Christ. That's a pretty good church. What else about Antioch? Well, Antioch was the church that sent the Apostle Paul off as a missionary. And he'd go off as a missionary and he'd come back to where? To Antioch. That's pretty special. Antioch was also the church that was involved in the Council of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15. You had the Pharisees that had come up and stirred people up, said you had to be circumcised, keep the dietary laws. The church of Antioch was the one that was at the center of that with the church of Jerusalem. This is an important church. Tradition tells us that the apostle Peter pastored the church for a while. Well, that's another good kind of notch in the belt. So along the way, uh, Ignatius becomes the bishop of Antioch. You would think if Ignatius taught anything that he wasn't supposed to teach, anything that was contrary to the apostles, that they would have run him out of town. If anybody knew the truth, it should have been the church of Antioch. Right? If we have a great falling away from the, the truth, and everybody all of a sudden becomes Catholic, it would be very hard to do that in this, this place of Antioch. I bring up Ignatius because we have seven of his letters still to this day. You could Google it and read it tonight. Seven letters. And uh, he wrote his seven letters while he was traveling from Antioch. He was arrested. He was traveling to Rome to be eaten by lions. 
And he knows he's going to be eaten by lions when he gets there. And he writes these letters as he goes. And so he dies as a martyr, which is an even uh, better kind of notch in that, that resume as well. In fact, it's one of the more striking quotes that you have from the fathers where he said, don't try to save me. When I get to Rome, my body is like the wheat that should be ground up to become the bread of the world. Just let me die. I'm ready to die. I'm ready to meet my Savior. What a wonderful spirit. One of the letters that he writes is to his friend, Polycarp of Smyrna, one of those three that I mentioned. Polycarp was personally trained by the Apostle John. The third one that I said, Clement of Rome, was ordained by the Apostle Peter, where? In Rome. That's three pretty good resumes. And, uh, and we still have their readings. By the way, when you read them, there's un they're unmistakably, when they talk about the Eucharist, when they talk about the authority of the church, they are unmistakably Catholic. Right? Either the church veered off, and I talked to Mormons about this, either the church wrecked really soon. I mean, and, and, and it's impossible to justify that, given uh, with these men and other proves that we have because the church appears Catholic and was Catholic from the very beginning. Now I just point out those guys because if they were personally trained by the apostles and they were distinctively Catholic, then if you had ten people sitting around the, the table, the person who, who, who has the interpretation that's closest to the apostles, what they teach, is going to hold more weight. And I think a lot of people, fair-minded people, would admit that. Now when I was a Baptist, I just... Uh, assumed that everybody in the Bible was a Baptist. I mean, even John was called the Baptist. Right? <laughs> Everybody's Baptist. Early church was Baptist. Somewhere along the way, Catholics came in and ruined everything, but we used to be Baptist. When Church of Christ looked at the Bible, they believed, they assume all of those, they were all Presbyterian, they were all Church of Christ, they were all like me. But we can point to history and say, listen, the Bible doesn't read itself, it doesn't interpret itself, it needs us. And that's where the imperfection comes in. Do we believe the Bible is perfect? Yes. Do we believe that we are perfect? No. Are you perfect? No. Right? But Jesus guaranteed the authority of the church. All right. That's, uh, if you look on your verse finder, on your first column, it talks about churches apostolic, the authoritative church. Those are good. Churches and followable. Second column. If you're talking specifically about uh, tradition, let's see, look at column three. It says, Bible alone or Bible plus tradition. And there you have commands in the Bible to follow the traditions. You say, didn't Jesus condemn tradition? He condemned man-made tradition. But if it's Jesus' tradition and the apostles' tradition, then that's part of these commands of Scripture. I like to use that... Uh, especially when I uh, maintain a, a relationship with somebody and they say, well, you're, you know, Catholics, you follow man-made traditions. I say, no, we follow the apostles' traditions. You follow man-made tradition. How do I know that? Because you have a founder that's not Jesus. <laughs> My founder is Jesus. And so those are good traditions. Those are things to follow. Uh, but at least that'll get you started. All right. So why do you worship Mary? We don't. Why, do you want, uh, don't, uh, why don't you want people to read the Bible? We do. But you have to be careful when you do it. Why do you baptize infants? Why do you baptize infants? And uh, the question that uh, may be underneath this is, baptism is just a symbol, and don't you have to have faith first, and then you get baptized? I'm thinking <coughs> specifically about the Baptist friends we have around us. I would have said that. You can't baptize a baby because a baby can't have faith. And this isn't actually in the point that I'm going to show you, but uh, one of the things that was striking to me is to point out, did Jesus ever heal someone based on the faith of somebody else? So he healed people based on their personal faith, that's true, but did he ever heal someone based on the faith of someone else? The answer is yes. Yes, He commonly did, right? Whether it was the centurion that came to him for his servant, and he says, wow, what great faith. I'll heal that guy. Wow, it's good to have a centurion like that. Or the Syrophoenician woman that came to him and says, my daughter has a demon, looks at her faith, and heals her daughter. The four uh, men that uh, lower down the paralytic, and he says, this man's sins are forgiven. Then just heal him. Forgives him. Why? Because he looks up and says, because of their faith, this man's sins are forgiven. 
So those are striking examples and things that I didn't realize um, didn't stand out to me when I, when I was a Baptist. All right, this is on page 24. Catholic baptism. Necessary? Is baptism necessary? Yes. yes. Is baptism the new birth? Right? People may say, are you born again? No. What are they asking? They're asking if you had an emotional experience or if you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. The Bible says it's baptism. And so I'll show you that in a second. So it's necessary. It's the new birth. Is it for adults? Absolutely. Is it for children? Yes. Can you see these things in the Bible? And I say yes. So Mark 16. Let's just read some scriptures. Jesus says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. John 3, 5. Jesus says, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is such an important verse, and of course Baptists know that this, this is in the Bible. But when I read this verse, and he said water and the Spirit, I really didn't have a good answer for it, but I would have said that in some way either the water symbolizes the Bible, and we're all born by the water of the washing of the Word. It's a stretch, biblically. Or this is a reference to the first birth that we all have, and uh, you know when the woman gives birth and there's fluid, maybe that's the water. I mean, this is, this is really shaky ground for a Baptist, but we try. But born of water and the Spirit. This is one of the really neat things about the church fathers. Challenge them. Say, listen, if Jesus taught his disciples that this was not baptism, show me one church father in the first thousand years of church history, the first thousand years, that didn't interpret this verse as baptism. This is one of the unanimous testimonies of the church fathers that when they looked at that verse, they knew it was baptism. Unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And so that new birth, this is very important for you. People walk around and say, I'm a born-again Christian. And so I'm a Catholic. Ooh, you need to be born again. I've already been baptized. This is, very, this is a very important point. And so that's a good challenge. Show me a single person in the first thousand years that didn't take this as baptism. Acts 2, 38-39, this is one of my favorites. Peter speaking at, uh, preaching at Pentecost. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? What's it going to do? For the remission of sins. If you ask people, does baptism wash away your sins? And a lot of people around here would say, no, it's just a symbol. And so that's not what the Bible says. It says it remits your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, it keeps going, and to your children. And to your children. Keep that in mind as we go through. Acts 16, 15. When she, that is Lydia, the seller of purple, was baptized, who else was baptized? Her whole house. These household baptisms are very important for us as Catholics. Acts 16.33, the Philippian jailer. We know him. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And he, taking them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, himself was baptized, and then what? His whole house gets baptized with him. His whole house. 1 Corinthians 1.16 Paul says, I baptized the household of Stephanus. Acts 22, 16. Remember when Paul is stricken uh, blind and he doesn't eat or drink anything for three days and Ananias is sent. Ananias comes in, the scales fall off of his eyes and this is what he says to Paul in Acts 22, 16. He says, why do you tarry? Why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's as clear as, as the Bible can get as far as what happens in baptism. Ephesians 5 says that uh, Christ might sanctify and cleanse with the washing of water by the Word. Colossians 2, this one's very important. For Catholics, why do we baptize babies? For us, there is a link established by the Bible that links Old Testament circumcision with New Testament baptism. In the Old Testament, think about this, in the Old Testament, when a person became a Jew, as an adult, male, then he had to be circumcised, right? That was a requirement in order to become a Jew. But not only did he have to be circumcised, all of the male people in his household had to be circumcised as well, and then the children as well. All of this, this was a sign of the covenant, the old covenant with God. 
And so, we see when people in the New Testament are coming into the New Covenant people with God, God gives them a sign. He gives them a sign of baptism. When an adult, and by the way, men and women this time, when an adult converts, what do they need to do? They need to be baptized. But also what happens is that every person in their family comes into that covenant relationship with God with that same symbol. Even babies? Yes, even babies as a part of that. And that's what Colossians 2 leaves. He says, In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What's the circumcision of Christ? Paul says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. Baptism is like circumcision, so we baptize babies. All right, and then lastly, 1 Peter. If Peter wasn't clear enough on Pentecost, he says, Be baptized for the remission of sins. This promise is also to your children. He goes further in his letter by saying, Once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being uh, prepared, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. He says, The like figure. Remember, we said that Adam was a figure of Christ. He says the ark and Noah was a figure of baptism. A life figure where that even baptism does also now save us. Does baptism save us? Peter said so. But that would be a challenging, does it wash away your sins? Oh, no. Well, the Bible says it does. Does it save you? Oh, no. But the Bible says it does. He says not the putting away of the dirt of the body. It's not just a bath. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's another good thing to challenge them with. And even, by the way, Luther and Calvin, they still baptize babies as well. This is a further development later on in the Reformation that they said, oh no, it has to be. By the way, the Reformers hated this idea that only adults can get baptized so much, they developed what they called, and persecuted in these Protestant countries, the third baptism, which is people that re-baptize people as an adult Say after you get after you believe you have to get baptized again. I've been baptized twice as well. Once as a child, and then I thought, well, now I'm a believer, I need to be rebaptized, and so I was baptized twice with this idea. And so these Anabaptists, uh, after the reformers, Anabaptist means another baptism. If you were baptized as a baby as a Catholic, they would rebaptize you as an adult and as a believer. That was your second baptism. But then if the authorities caught you, they'd give you the third baptism, which was they'd drown you. <laughs> the third baptism. And so even the reformers really didn't like this idea of, uh, of people getting rebaptized. That's a neat historical note. By the way, that's where Baptist comes from today. They say, I'm a Baptist. It comes from the Anabaptists that John Smith adopted. All right, so if you look at your verse finder, look on the back, column number two. Infant baptism, and it'll give you those uh, similar verses as well, and a few more. All right, and it gives you some some good saint quotes also. Mm -hmm. All right. Why do you baptize infants? Why do you believe the bread and wine turn into the body and blood of Christ? <laughs> I, I put this one in there because it's so important, but. Not many people ask me this question. We, we try to avoid this question. I always try to avoid this question because the passage in the Bible is, is, is hard for me to explain any other way but a Catholic way of looking at it. So let's go, let's see. Page 25. Oh, there it is. So, Matthew 26. Somebody said, why do you believe that? So, because Jesus said it was. I mean, that's our answer to all of these. Matthew 26, take, eat, this is my body. Mark 14, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for me. But John 6 is the key passage. When someone says, listen, I just take the Bible literally, what it says, I believe. I say, great. Let's look at John chapter number 6. Oh, yeah. Because this is, this is, as Catholics, one of the most important passages that we have. Jesus says, John 6, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eats this bread, he shall live forever. If he stopped there, we don't have a concrete foundation to say that the bread and wine become his body and blood. Because he says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And for Protestants and Baptists, they say, well, listen, Jesus' bread 
in the same way that He is a door. You know, Jesus says, I am the door. I am a gate. I am a shepherd. The Bible calls Him the Lamb of God. He's not actually a lamb. He's not actually a door. He's not actually a gate. He says, I'm the light of the world. He's not actually light. Right? These are, this is Jesus speaking metaphorically. You silly Catholics, don't you know metaphorical language when you hear it? Right? And they would be right if you only had half of a verse in verse 51. But then he keeps talking. <laughs> and that's where we get the, the argument. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. At this point, Jesus stops speaking metaphorically. And he starts talking literally. How do we know? Because this is what I mean. Well, he wasn't a door, he wasn't a lamb. I said, but was he flesh? Did he have flesh? Yes. Is he literally flesh? Yes. Yes, he's literally flesh. He says, I will give my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man be bread? No, that's not, the, that's not what they said. That's not what they had the problem with. He says, How can this man give us his flesh? They knew what he had just said, and they knew what the problem was here. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the bread. He says, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. This is one of my favorite verses, the one that's coming up. I say it after I receive communion. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I like to pray it after communion because I'm reminding God of his promises. <laughs> <laughs> All right, God, you remember you said this. Right? It's a promise. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have eternal life. He's speaking literally. I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh. He didn't say my, the bread. He said, my flesh is meat indeed. My blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. From that time, by the way, the Greek word here for eats is the, is the literal Greek word gnaws on. I mean, th this is a very powerful uh, figure and image. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. This was too much. And uh, as Scott Hahn pointed out, and this is important to point out, Jesus at this point does not stop them and say, you misunderstand me. They're leaving because he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he doesn't say, wait, 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 let me, it was metaphorical, right? No, 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 he used metaphorical by saying bread. But then he says, my flesh and blood, and they leave, and we know he looks at the twelve and says, are you also going to leave? And Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life, what is that? That this is my flesh, this is my blood. By the way, do they fully understand this? No. But when Jesus at the Last Supper says, this is my flesh, this is my blood, now we understand. Right? Again, this is a great challenge for our friends in the Protestant community. Show me in the first few centuries, show me in the first thousand years, someone, some, anyone that doubted that this becomes the body and blood of Christ. Show me that they took it symbolically, that they didn't take it literally. And I point him especially to that Ignatius of Antioch because he, he makes it a point to again and again reference what we have in the Eucharist. By the way, why do we call it the Eucharist? Eucharist uh, just means Thanksgiving. Right? This is our Thanksgiving meal with God. Paul certainly believed it was important. 1 Corinthians 10 the cup of blessing which we bless is not just the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ. Uh, if someone asks, why can't I receive communion at the Catholic Church? My favorite answer, Dr. Andrews used it in his call to communion, uh, call in show. Why can't I receive communion when I go to the Catholic Church? And you say, it would be too dangerous. We don't let you take communion because you could die. What? You could die. It'd make you sick or you could die. These are possibilities. Too dangerous. Also, if you are in mortal sin, you had not been in confession, you say, right, well, I, mean, I think we should just let, you know, if people love the Lord, they should be able to take communion. We don't want people to die. I said, well, we'd be merciful. It's not merciful to kill people. We have to be careful with the table, right? Father, uh, this in the process where we called what he does uh, just for communion, the closing of the table. And I did it before we had communion in our church every week. And I would say, listen, 
Make sure you're carefully prepared. And I thought it was a symbol. How much more if it's the body and blood of Christ? Because Paul says, This is my body which is broken for you. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, drink the, this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He that eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks, this is very serious language, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You receive it unworthily, and he goes on to say, for this reason, some of you in Corinth are sick, and some of you have died, because you're taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. Straightforward teaching of Christ and His apostles, and universal church was that it is the body and blood of Christ. By the way, if this is the only point that we talk about, how much, how strong of a point is this as Catholic? That's why I say it's very popular. Take him to John six when you're talking about the Bible. All right, next question. We're going to make it. Why do you believe in purgatory? Why do you believe in purgatory? I think for Protestants, they assume that purgatory is this kind of massive doctrine of the church, right? By the way, as a Baptist, I thought that your church got rid of purgatory, right? After some meeting they had in the 60s, Vatican II or something, they told Catholics that they could eat fish on Fridays and they didn't have to believe in purgatory anymore. Right? <laughs> that was what I, that's what I thought, right? So when we talk about purgatory, this isn't that big of a difference uh, as far as what happens after people die, this is really connected to salvation and our difference in belief in, in how a person is saved. And I could just summarize it by saying this. It has biblical uh, uh, grounding. Uh, and I'll show you that in just a second. But just as a basic story, the big reason why we have to have purgatory in our beliefs and Protestants don't is that when you place your faith in Christ, at that moment, uh, God just declares you holy. Right? And in those that believe in what saved, always saved, there's nothing you could do to become unholy. Right? You are declared to be holy, and you could still be on the inside the most rotten person in the world, but God's declared you to be holy, so when you die, if you die at that moment, you go straight to heaven. Right? Because you're holy. You are clean at that. God's declared it. As Catholics, we don't believe that it's just a declaration. We do believe it's a declaration. But not only do we, why does God declare it? God declares it because He starts making you holy. That is, He starts actually working righteousness into you. That pro, that's the process of sanctification. Sanctification isn't necessarily connected to salvation for Protestants. For Catholics, it is absolutely essential. When we start down that road to salvation, God, it's a continual road of sanctification, increasing righteousness, and if that process isn't complete when you die, God's going to make sure it's complete before you go to heaven. Why does it have to be, why do you have to have this process of purgatory? Because nothing unclean gets to go to heaven. By the way, purgatory, uh, it, it, it is a refining uh, and a cleansing and a sanctification, but I deserve purgatory. I mean, I do the best I can to get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> with indulgences, with, with penance, with whatever it may be. I mean, I want to be the best person I can and work on sanctification as much as I can on this earth. But when I think about all my sins, I think, you know what, God, I, I deserve a pretty good amount of purgatory, whatever that may be. Two big objections that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that's offensive in a Protestant Bible with purgatory. Number one is that it's the special place that God sends you to. It's not heaven and it's not hell. It's the special place the Bible doesn't talk about three places. It talks about two places, heaven or hell, a special place. The church doesn't say it's necessarily a place. Uh, they also say that you're set there for a thousand years or a hundred years or a certain amount of time. The church doesn't say that you're set there for a certain amount of time. In fact, Pope Benedict, pretty sure he's Catholic. No, he's right. Pope Benedict. He says, and I, I love the way he characterizes it, he says, listen, God is a consuming fire. And think of purgatory as that all-consuming God of fire and love embracing you after death. And he, when He embraces you in love, He also purges away all the remaining attachments to sin. And what? He embraces you as He takes you to heaven. That's purgatory. Well, that makes it seem a lot nicer, doesn't it? And so, and by the way, I'm pretty sure He has a firm grasp on what's Catholic and what's not. So it's not necessarily a place, not, not necessarily time, 
because these are things that are outside of space and time. So, that's very important. So are you burned up then? No, so, and that's <laughs> another thing, is that it's not a third state. That is, some people go to heaven, some people go to hell, and some people go to purgatory. Purgatory is God's final step of sanctification on the way to heaven. And so I hope I make it to purgatory, because that means I'm heading to the right place. Yeah, but does fire burn you there? Uh, yes, so in the same way that... Um, when it, talking about when God is a consuming fire, uh, then 1 Corinthians, and I'll show you the verse in just a second, says that we're saved by that purifying fire. We're saved through fire. First Corinthians chapter number 3, if you want to point to it. Paul says, Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, that is your life, you have all these things, some good, some bad, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, that is the final judgment day, it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, if any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, right? You're on your way. But by fire. But by fire. And so uh, this is that final stage of, of purification sanctification. Why do we need it? Revelation chapter 21 says, There shall in no way enter into heaven anything that defiles, neither whatever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And God purifies us before we get there. By the way, when someone says, listen, there's either heaven or there's hell, the whole idea that there's somewhere else isn't biblical. Well, 1 Peter 3, this is called the hallowing of, of death or of hell traditionally, says that Christ suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which He also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And the idea that the Old Testament saints, uh, before they could enter into heaven, Christ gives the atonement, He dies on the cross, and while He's dead, it, it talks about Him uh, preaching to these spirits in prison. And so, this doesn't prove purgatory, this just shows you that uh, the concept that some people can't go to heaven until Christ's atonement is applied to them in the right way, is a biblical concept. And for Protestants, they have a hard time. I had a hard time with this verse and what exactly it meant. And so sometimes it's a good one to point out. All right. Anything on purgatory? Well, there's no way we're going to get into good works and we're going to finish that tonight. So we're going to have to <coughs> talk about that next week. But any questions or comments uh, as, as we end? Something I jumped over? Something you thought about along the way? Oh, let me show you a purgatory on your sheet. On the back, column two, uh, purgatory there uh, in the middle. There's a lot of good verses that go with that. Just the idea that Jesus says that uh, uh, that there is there's the possibility of judgment after death. By the way, the, the most popular objection to this idea of purgatory is they say, and this is one that I thought of when I was thinking about purgatory, kind of working through these things. Paul at one point, I, I thought, says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if that's the case, then he assumes there's no middle ground. If I die here, I appear where, where God is. It's actually, and I went back and checked, I said, well, the whole system falls apart. I found the one missing link in Catholic theology. It's that verse. But I went back and read, read the verse, and then I felt bad, because I misquoted the verse. In my mind, it's not. it, it was written that way, but it's not. Paul doesn't say to be absent from the body is to be present with, with the Lord. In the passage, he says, I would rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Right? If I had my choice of being alive here or alive there, I want to be alive there. And so if someone brings it up, very nicely point out that they've just misquoted Scripture. Scripture, isn't it? It's in 1 Corinthians... Uh, no. I'd have to look it up, brother. Because I want to say that uh, it's, it's either in Timothy or Corinthians. I just want to say Timothy because uh, Paul is near death, but it could be correct. All right, any questions, comments?
We're zooming, zoomed through. All right. Well, we'll address this next week. Next week is our last class. Uh, then we'll have a movie night on Wednesday night, and then Deacon Adrian's going to pick up with his Genesis to Jesus Bible study, which he'll show a video for about 20, 30 minutes. It's a professionally done video from uh, Scott Hahn's uh, St. Paul Center for Biblical... I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Something like that. And, uh, and then there's discussion points and things and the whole working. It, it, it'll be a great study, but that'll, that'll start in, in, uh, in three weeks. Is um, that um, Bible study from Genesis to um, Jesus or Revelation and all, is it going to be a permanent thing or is it going to go on for a certain amount of time? It's a certain amount of time. And so what we'll use Wednesdays for is that at this point you're tired of listening to me. So you can listen to Deacon Adrian for a while, but we'll, we'll try to keep things on Wednesday nights as kind of a continuing adult education and formation uh, night. Right, so whatever it may be. Uh, as we get into Lent and leading up to Easter, we're going to have a series on the Eucharist, uh, also video-based, and we'll rediscuss as well uh, when those things are coming up. Any other questions? Let's go to Lord in prayer. Could you pass around a piece of paper so if we want the, uh, your, we can write our email and everything. Yes, come up here and, and I'll get your email address. And, I'll, I'll see. Yep. and by the way, uh, if you know of somebody that you would uh, challenge to read it, you know, say read through this as a guy that converted for these reasons. Well, it's a commitment. Guys, well, you got email I, I'd send it as the, the paper, Baptist pastor to Catholic convert. But uh, I send it in segments now. Most people are, are more willing to read five pages, and then I can give them more rather than saying, oh, here's 40, and checking back next week. You read it yet? Uh, <laughs> not yet. Yeah, almost. I looked at it. All right, let's go to God in prayer. We'll be done. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, we pray as we leave this place that you give us the joy of the gospel. Uh, Lord, more than facts and, 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 and uh, verse references and uh, even theological points, Lord, that we memorize and this readiness that we have uh, at the foundation of it all, the core of it all, we have met person, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he has changed us and he saved us. And he is saving, he has saved us in the past, is saving us now. And we pray will save us in the future. And we want others to encounter Him. And encounter Him through the truth. And so we want to give a reasonable defense. And understand why we believe what we believe. Um, but ultimately we want them to have that loving encounter. With a, with a Savior who can, who can change them. And save them from sin. And, and uh, they, can, they can be changed from servants of sin. And slaves to this world. To children of God. And we pray that you give us opportunities to share that hope, that joy, that peace that Christ has given to us with the community that you've made us missionaries to. We pray all these things in the name which is above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.